David, you may go ahead. Okay, I'm over here on the uh, on the side of your screen, folks. So I want to welcome you to the Kern Fire Safe Council's May 2023 Community Wide Webinar. I'm David Stenstrom. I'm here tonight with uh, Kathleen Weinstein, and we offer these seminars uh, with these webinars to Kern County residents to help prepare for wildfire and just about any other disaster that California has to offer. Being prepared for any emergency will save you a lot of anxiety and also possibly could save your life. And knowing what agencies are in our community to help us during emergencies, well, you know, that can be a lot of anxiety there too. So um, at this point, I do want to recommend and ask, please, that you mute yourself. If you mute yourself, so now that you put your question and put your questions in writing in the chat room, okay? Uh, our speaker has a lot of information today, and we want to make sure you get to hear all of it. And if you submit a question and it isn't answered on the on the webcast, we will email the answer to you. Okay? Um, we're we're pleased to have our speaker, Tom Crow. He's a disaster cycle services volunteer with the Red Cross. Tom and the American Red Cross Pillowcase Project have partnered with the Current Fire Safe Council at our Ready, Set, Go school presentations at the Wildlife Wildland Urban Interface Schools here in Kern County. Tonight, Tom is gonna to tell us more about the Red Cross and the American Red Cross and their disaster services. Tom, now we're gonna make you co-host now, so pull up your presentation, share your screen, and we will know when you are ready, when we see the first slide, looks like we see it right now. Tom, ladies and gentlemen, Tom Crow of the American Red Cross. All right, good. Thank you very much, David. Well, we're happy to be here. So today, what we're going to talk about is what is the Red Cross? And then we're going to talk about the services offered by the Red Cross. Um, and, uh, again, I'm a volunteer with the Red Cross. Um, I've been with them for roughly around seven years. And then the manager for the disaster cycle services is Irene Parveen. And we were very lucky to get Irene. She's been there for the past year, but she worked for the United Nations. And she's been all over the world helping uh, people with uh, and the, during these different disasters. So it's very good to have Irene here. So today we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit about the Red Cross. The Red Cross was basically founded by Clara Barton in 1881. And the Red Cross basically provides emergency assistance, disaster relief, and they help people prepare for an emergency. And we're going to talk more about that. Now, the services offered by the Red Cross. Some of you people have heard of it, which is the biomedical. In other words, the Red Cross provides half of the nation's blood supply. Uh, international uh, Red Cross is an international uh, entity. It's the world's largest humanitarian network. And they provide relief for one in 65 people in the world every year. Uh, service to the armed forces, uh, they provide 24 seven global emergency communication services between us and the uh, soldiers that are overseas. Training, here's a big thing here, health and safety. They provide training in first aid, water safety, CPR, how to use a defibrillator. And last year they did provide a training to over 4.6 million people. Uh, disaster cycle services, we're gonna talk more about this because we definitely, everybody saw, have been faced with a lot of different types of disasters. But again, disaster service services, uh, they manage emergency response relief and recovery for people affected by different types of disasters, which we're going to talk about. Now, one thing people don't realize is that the Red Cross has a big program for smoke detectors. We install many smoke detectors and uh, we install anywhere from 20 to 40 a week. And we work closely with the fire department to install smoke detectors in people's houses. Um, these are free of charge, and um, you can, <clears throat> we'll show you up how to sign up online. We also provide education programs on how to be prepared for disasters. And our uh, different pr programs we have are Be Red Cross Ready, Pillowcase, and Pedro, depending upon the uh, age of the audience. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about here. We're going to disaster cycle services. What we're going to focus on today is preparation. We have to have the people get prepared for these types of disasters so um, they'll be ready to uh, respond. Uh, respond means meet the medic needs, which is uh, working or setting up shelters. But mostly we want to focus on preparation. How do we prepare ourselves for these different disasters? Okay, what are the different hazards that we faced with, especially here in California? Let's talk about here. We got home fires, definitely, earthquakes, flooding, hard to believe in Bakersfield. We're going to be looking at flooding here. Um, so, flooding, earthquakes, home fires, and of course, wildfires. And uh, we've had a lot of those problems here in California the past year. What I want to show you here is the Red Cross is here to help everyone. Here's a particular disaster, all the thing, homes been demolished or whatever, we have a Red Cross person there. Here we have a wildfire, again, a Red Cross vehicle there. And then also if you have a home fire, we have people that go there and help the people, the families that have been displaced by uh, their house being burned down. And what we usually do is we open up shelters for the people to go. They can stay in the shelter, we feed them, we provide uh, medical services, mental health services, so we have a safe place for those people to go if their case if there's a disaster and their house is destroyed. We also have what we call a disaster action team. This is a un, uh, not a unique group, but it certainly has helped. Would you believe in Bakersfield we average one to two fires a day? The fire department will call the Red Cross. We're on call 24/7, and then we will send a team to them to that family that's been displaced to provide financial assistance, comfort kits, blankets, and water. And these families are so happy to see someone arrive and help them uh, with their need. This is typically what we see in a shelter or anywhere. Definitely a Red Cross person there helping someone. They've lost everything. And of course, the child is sitting there and saying, oh boy, we've got, we're so happy that somebody's helping. Okay, so what we want to do is, okay, let's talk about preparing for a disaster. Have you planned for, and I ask people, there's going to be a delay in help. Usually it takes one to two days to get help there. There's definitely power outages, road closures, property damage, lack of clean water, living in a shelter, and basically everybody will probably know uh, limited or no communication. So we have to plan for that. We can be ready. Okay, so the first thing you do is to get ready for something, you have to have a kit. You have to have stuff. This is very similar to ready, said, go kits. Emergency supplies, what do we need in our kit? Just basic things such as water, food, first aid kit, and medication. Many of the times that we have people that come to shelters, they do not have their first aid kit, or basically they don't even have their own medication. It presents a lot of problems. What else do we need to have in our kit? First, flashlights, right? Radio, batteries, cash. Well, people say, why do I need cash? Well, remember, no power. You can't get any money out of an ATM. There's no power. Contact information, important papers. And of course, don't forget your pet. You need pet supplies. In your personal kit, usually I have mine as a sturdy container or backpack. Usually try to keep the three days supplies per person. And you update that at least twice a year. Uh, if you're going to be uh, staying at home and whatever, you want to make sure that you have enough supplies, food supplies for two weeks. Of course, change of clothes, hygiene, toys, and books and magazines. It always seems that any time a disaster hits, it's always between midnight and seven in the morning. It's just you can set your clock to it, right? So I always have, and you should have by your bed, a thing of sturdy shoes, flashlight, prescription eyeglasses, and of course, be careful when you have to evacuate that you don't step on any glass. So I have this right by my bed. These are things that you should have uh, by your bed. Okay, here is the thing that we have. There's certain things that you need depending upon where you're going to be. Like under the bed, you can see here, we have a certain number of items that you need. But here's another one thing here, and I can't uh, go up. Um, right here, in this column right here, there's a, it has the most items, 
these are things you want to have in your car, right? So you can picture this. If you're in Bakersfield, you need to go over the grapevine. And everybody knows that when you leave Bakersfield, it could be hot or whatever, but then you get to the grapevine, it could be snowing. You could be stranded two hours, three hours, four hours. So here's something that you want to have. Make sure you have in your car if you're going to go up over the grapevine and whatever. All of these items right here, from flashlights to tools to batteries, medications, and whatever. So there's a number of things that you have if it's just by your bed or if you're going to be driving in your car. Or also be careful, take some of this stuff because you have to be at work. You may be stranded at work for some of these disasters. Okay, make a plan. Wow, what are we gonna do? Make a plan. Okay, home fires. Would you believe that in Bakersfield, we average calls from the fire department one to two house fires a day. One to two a day that we respond to the Red Cross. Most of the home fires are caused by cooking, problems in the kitchen. It's hard to believe people will actually burn stuff in the kitchen, but they do. Uh, the next problem that we have is electrical. And of course, the third problem, the number of fires caused is by smoking. But by far, most causes of fires are caused by cooking in the kitchen. Okay, make a plan. We need to make a plan. What are we going to do at home? Okay, your plan is house evacuation. Uh, you usually have to have an out-of-state contact. You have to have two evacuation routes in your house, no matter where you go. So you have to have a window or a door or two doors or something like that. Once you leave your house, you're gonna have a place to meet. And also if you have a plan, you have to plan for your pets and consider what to do if you are at home or away. Everybody prepares for what they're doing at home, but everybody should also prepare if you go and visit, let's say a friend or whatever like that. Do they have evacuation plans? Do you have, can you get the windows open? Can you can get the doors open. So the idea that practice makes perfect and so you should add an evacuation plan. And you should do this two times a year. And then the evacuation plan, again, you pretend like, oh, if there's a fire in one of the rooms, how do you get out? You get out the door or you get out a window. You have to have two routes. Um, review your supplies, test smoke detectors, right? But one important thing is once you leave your house, you're going to have to muster at some point uh, close by. That's very important. In my house, we muster the mailbox across the street. Now you say, wow, why is that important? It's important from the fire department because when they go to a house fire, the first thing they will do is they go to a point where they see that there's a muster or a lot of people and they can determine who is missing right away. So they can make the decision is I go in to get that person or I don't really have to, there's no, no problem there, okay? Get out and stay out. Here's a very big issue in here, right? So once you leave the house, you have to stay out. Um, some people says, oh my gosh, I find out I'm missing someone, right? They have to make a decision. Do I stay where I am and let the fire department go in? Or do I go in back in myself and try to save somebody? Unfortunately, the statistics shows, and the firemen will all tell you this, is the people who go back into a house, a burning house, to try to save one, someone, 80% of them don't come back out. Wow. So once you get out, you have to stay out, right? Uh, call 911. Again, provide information when the fire department comes, how many people are inside. You know right away if you have a muster point. Um, look at location that you saw the missing people. All right. Reduce fire risks at home. Of course, if you, you're cooking stuff in the kitchen, don't leave it, don't leave. <laughs> and uh, uh, never leave anything burning unattended. And of course, install fire extinguishers. I don't know how many people have fire extinguishers that are close by in the kitchen. We have two of them in our kitchen. Um, then make sure, and I've actually told my wife, uh, basically you have to be taught on how you learn to use the fire extinguishers, right? So again, make sure don't leave anything burning on the kitchen table, on the burner. Three feet, uh, reduce the fire risk in your home. You go uh, outlets, make sure you have a minimum number of things plugged into your outlets. We've gone to some houses, we've had as many as six or seven different plugs in one outlet. So make sure that you don't overload those. Smoking, well, what else can we say about that? Never smoke in bed or when drowsy. 
Uh, never smoke where medical oxygen is used. Keep matches and lighters away from kids. Okay, remember we talked about smoke alarms. Smoke alarms save lives. We install 20 to 40 a week, right? We installed one in, one in every bedroom, one in the hallway, and also one in the living area if it's not too close to the uh, kitchen. We test them every month. Uh, and mostly the ones that we install, they have 10 year batteries. So you don't have to uh, worry about those. And um, so we replace them after every 10 years. Here, remember I said we, this, the uh, Red Cross installs smoke detectors. This is a huge program for us. So what you can do is you can go online and in a web browser, put in this poundandhomefires.org and follow these procedures, put your address in there. We look at this every week and then we schedule homes to go to to install smoke detectors. Huge program. Okay, big thing is, the kids have to be involved also, right? So you have to tell them about the dangers of fire. Tell them what a smoke alarm, what, what does it sound like? Um, how do you open a windows? Or how do you escape if you're gonna use a ladder, right? Meet at a designated safe meeting place. And then how to call 911. So get the kids involved on in doing these things. Okay, be and take action. Again, make a home fire escape plan, test your smoke alarms every month, and then practice your home fire escape plan. In my house here, we usually practice once every two months. And then if actually somebody comes over to our house, we say, these are where the exits are, this is where our mustard pot's going to be. Okay, be informed. This is always the hardest part of, I think, people want to know where, what is the disaster? Where do I go? What are the conditions? So know how to respond to these different risks. But again, if you have a radio, radio stations, if you go, here's one in English and Spanish, they will tell you, you go to these radio stations, they will tell you, this is where the disaster is. These are the roads that are closed. These are the shelters that are open. This is where you need to go. There's another site that we have, which is called Ready Kern. You can sign up for this online and they will send you text messages of where the disaster is, what roads are open and closed, where you can go for shelters, that type of information. Here's an interesting one, Smart 911. Have you ever thought about this? When you dial 911, the operator comes on the line, says, what is your, pro what is your problem? And then you have to try to explain this, right? In Smart 911, you give all that information beforehand. You get on, you register, and for me, for example, I put in, these are all of my uh, medicines that I'm taking. Here's the dosages. Here's where I have some issues with back problems, uh, things like this. Here's my contact point. Here's my doctor's telephone number. Here's my vet's telephone number. All of that information is there put in for 911. So when you call 911, that EMT, will be able to pull up that information and says, oh, this person's on a certain type of drug. I need to remember uh, whatever I have to do. Or... So those are very good, smart 911. Know where your nearest fire station, police station, and hospital are. Where, where do I have to drive? I have to take somebody. Also know your surroundings. I call it conduct a hazard hunt, okay? So you can look around your house or even when you go to other people's houses. Look for things that may fall or break. Also look to see, are there things blocking the exits, the windows, the doors? Um, what, are there any fire hazards that you should notice? Um, here's an important thing. Know how to shut off the water, the gas, and electricity. Um, I told, showed that to uh, my wife. Actually, I asked my wife, I said, hey, uh, we need to shut off the water, gas, and electricity. And she said, hmm, show me how to do that. So. We showed her how to do that. She feels comfortable with that. One thing I want to know is about the gas. If you want to shut the gas off, you need a wrench to be able to turn the valve on the gas meter. So I have a wrench on mine with a chain on it locked around the meter so that if I have to shut the gas off, I can use that wrench to do that. Okay, earthquakes. I think everybody's been in an earthquake here. What do we do? Okay, drop, cover, and hold on. That's what the major thing is here. We drop, we cover, we hold on, get under a table and hold on. What if I can't find cutter? Cover as much as possible. Find an interior wall. 
Stay clear of windows. Evacuate building once the shaking stops. You have to be careful about that if you're, uh, let's say if you're in a high rise, Los Angeles, New York City. If you evacuate the building, you have to make sure that with the high rises, things don't fall down. What are shaking your curls while I'm in bed? Okay, well, cover your head, avoid flying objects. In my car, pull over to the side of the road, stop and set the parking brake, stay inside the vehicle until shaking stops. They even go, the fire department even goes further that says, if you need to leave in your car, avoid going underneath underpasses. Wildfires, boy, we've had a lot of wildfires this past uh, two years. And uh, one of the things they have to talk about here is clean the roof and the gutters, maintain a defensible space of 30 feet around your house, prune the trees. But I think the biggest thing here where we have found basically in places like Paradise, uh, Erskine Fire, whatever, evacuate early. When they say get out, get out right away, because many of the times you find out that you will not be able to outrun one of these fires. So evacuate early. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, preparedness services and against making presentations. We have uh, youth presentations. Um, and then that's using uh, Pedro adult presentations to be Red Cross ready. Okay, flooding, hard to believe. We actually are talking about flooding in Bakersfield. Uh, I've been here since 1982 and we haven't had one flood. Now we're talking about floods. But again, this is the most frequent death, natural disaster in the United States, uh, can happen anywhere. Uh, if you have a flood and whatever, definitely get to higher ground, right? Uh, turn around, don't drive in a uh, uh, flooded area and avoid contact with the flood water. Uh, flood risk, drowning, contaminated water. And now we're finding out after some of these areas, especially on the East Coast that had a lot of the flooding, um, it's dried and whatever. Now they're having mold problems and that can create a whole new set of health issues. Um, after a flood, let other know that you're safe. Make sure the water is safe to use. Okay, additional resources. These are some of the things that you can go if you want to get additional information on what to do during an earthquake, uh, wildfire, house fire, and whatever. Uh, FEMA, I think everybody's heard about FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. You can go there and they'll give you a lot of other information on assistance. Uh, CPR and first aid training, we provide a lot of that training here locally in um, Bakersfield. And now here's another important number, Red Cross National Dispatch. If you ever run into a problem, whether it be contact with an over, a, a soldier overseas, or you have your house just burned down, or you have any other type of issue, call the Red Cross National Dispatch. They will lead you in the right direction on who to talk to specifically about your problem to get it solved. Very important number. Okay, we have a lot of Red Cross mobile apps, anything dealing with earthquakes, first aid, shelter, wildfire. Um, okay, so I said before that the Red Cross consists of 95% volunteers. That's amazing. I was shocked when I first heard that, 95% volunteers. So we're always looking for new volunteers that can make presentations, be assigned to go to different locations, work in shelters. We just had a request for somebody that wanted to go to Guam. Wow. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a Red Cross volunteer, go to this webpage or talk to Megan Hughes and she's in charge of the volunteers um, and the recruitment here in Bakersfield and then there's her cell number. So get involved if you can. There's one thing I liked about the Red Cross and, uh, was at the end of the day, you says, I help somebody. I feel good because I help so much. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, that was great information. Um, and you know, uh, I don't think anybody, anybody anywhere could not know what the that the Red Cross is, is involved in. And uh, we appreciate the work that all the people do at the Red Cross and do for disaster relief, community safety and outreach like you're doing now. Um, um, so we can throw it up for, for some questions. Um, 
our website at currentfiresafe.org. It has a section where you can voice your concerns. You can ask questions and give advice. And if you have a topic for a, a webinar, you can let us know. Many resources on the website to help you and your feedback is welcome. You can review our previous uh, webinars too. So if you missed something today in the lecture, you have questions about today's lecture. Uh, uh, Kathleen, um, do we have any questions that, uh, that have come in? Yes, there's one. Uh, is the Red Cross CPR training free? And do you come out to the uh, communities to do it or is it located in Bakersfield? You're muted, Tom, you're muted. Okay, there we go, sorry. It's um, the training is done in uh, Bakersfield at the Bakersfield office. Um, you usually get online and sign up online for the CPR training. Um, it depends on which organization that you're involved with, but uh, most of the time there is a fee to go through the training and they'll train you in CPR and how to use a defibrillator. Uh, good, good. Yes, can I ask uh, uh, the funding for the American Red Cross? You, you have a tremendous amount that are of people that are volunteers, but who, uh, where does the funding come for the Red Cross? Well, that's a great question. Would you believe that the Red Cross only does not receive any government funding? It's all donations by people. And usually what we find is during a disaster, and right after a disaster, we get a flood of people that make a, a lot of donations to the Red Cross. And you can specify, for example, if you make a donation, it says, okay, I only want this money to go to uh, problems in Kern County or problems in Bakersfield, or you can say, I only wanted to go to people, help people in Florida. You can specify that. Um, so most, all the money that we receive from the Red Cross is donations, um, which is, well, that's good. We have another question. Uh-huh. And here, it is. if you have to go to the shelter, do you need to bring any documents or anything else with you to, in order to get in? Um, well, whatever documents you have, we have a lot of people that their house has been destroyed and whatever, and the only thing they have is a shirt on their back. They come to the shelter and we register them. In other words, we will put down their name, address, whatever. If they don't have their um, ID or whatever like that, that's okay, we understand. Um, so um, no, you, we will let you in the shelter if you don't, you don't have any ID or whatever like that. Do you, um, a lot of people won't part with their dogs and, and their animals. Uh, do you accommodate them? We, um, well, two things. It depends on what, if it's a service dog or whatever, we can't deny uh, those type of dogs coming in with their masters in the shelter. All other animals are not service dogs or whatever. What we do is uh, we'll put the people in the shelter, but usually we have another contractor that comes in and will take care of all of those animals. They'll bring in cages. They'll make sure that the, the uh, dogs are fed um, and they have a place to stay. So, All right. Here's another question. Thank you. Uh, you showed the slide with cooking fires as the number one cause of home fires. Um, I think it should... I, I think it should be the death from home fires is the highest from home fires that are caused by smoking, which makes sense. But I wanted to confirm um, that, uh, um, yes, should, uh, should, yes. It's a question of whether, what is the number one, smoking or cooking? I think it depends on the cook. <laughs> Well, it, according to the data that we have right here, the number of fires caused by, um, uh, in the kitchen was 46%, and of that, 19% of it was uh, deaths. Um, the uh, smoking only accounted for 5% of the house fires. Um, but of course, there was, a lot, there was a few more deaths and whatever. So, um, I don't know, that's all data that I've 
that Scott, I really can't argue one way or the other. Only to say is that more house fires are started in the kitchen. Right, right. It's the same thing. Um, wildfires, 95% of wildfires are started by human causes. So it looks the same kind of statistics here where uh, electrical is not the big cause. It's more uh, fires from cooking, fires from not protecting yourself from smoking. Right. And these are easy things to correct too, right? Because right, every, right. yeah. every time we go to install smoke detectors, we also walk around and we talk to the people about, hey, this seems unsafe or whatever. We'll, <clears throat> we'll say, hey, you need to remove some of the plugs in here. Or um, we, we, we run into a lot of things where windows, you can't get windows open, or you can't get doors open, or things are blocking. So we, we, we also not only install smoke detectors, but we go through and we give them an analysis of what we found about the risks of what can cause home fires and escape. Um, another question, um, there should be two ways out of every room, uh, you know, and of course there'll be bathrooms where there's no way out except the door. But uh, if there's, if you're upstairs and there's a door and it's hot and you have a window that doesn't open, what would be the best way to get out of that room? Well, again, again, if you have a door, it's hot. Then what happens, they typically say, if the door is hot, do not open it, go out another way. Now, when they say, this is another thing, when we go through people's houses, usually you have to have two exit points. You have a door and you have a window. But then you say, okay, I can't get out the window. Why can't you get out the window, right? Either the window doesn't open or you got bars on the windows. Um, so that's just something that you have to correct, that you have to have two ways out. Why can't you get out the window? Is it too small or is it the fact that you've got bars or we've gone in some houses, they've actually had the windows screwed shut, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, especially in some cases where they say, uh, we have bars on the windows and we say, hey, let's, let's do it. If you can't get out the door, what are you gonna do? And of course, the people will look at us and say, mm, you're right, that's a problem. I said, yes. Um, the same thing happened to me in one of my, when I was back on the East Coast, I was visiting one of my friends. It was in a million dollar home, it's crazy. And we go upstairs and not one of the windows could we get open. And I said, John, John, I can't get any of the windows open. He said, yeah, it's been that way. That's the way I bought the house. And I said, that's dangerous. So I had two choices. I either go to another location to stay, or what I did is I went to bed with a sledgehammer by my bed. And I made sure that if there was a fire or whatever, I was going to get out that room. <laughs> so that's what I tell the people. If you can't, if you know, you can't get the window open, you go to bed with a sledgehammer or something that you can break the window. Right. Like you have one of those uh, little uh, hammers in your car to get out of the car if, if you can't uh, get the, the locks to work. Exactly. You know, and get out. Yeah. Uh, no, Tom, Tom you, you gave the list. You showed the list of the things that we all should have. And, um, you know, in your go bag uh, and in your car and, you know, what you should have. Is there some, um, you know, when you, if you come, if there's a, an evaluation that can come by, do they come by and, uh, the smoke alarm thing, uh, when, you, when you're putting those in, you're able to talk to people about, about well, you've got, there's, you can't get out of this room other than the door, et cetera, like that. Uh, so that's, you've got, but if you deal with those things now and realize that the bars are on the window, you see that in advance before you're all anxious and trying to get out, that um, that's part of the advanced planning that we we really have to do. Um, in the go bag, like uh, a friend of mine didn't have a go bag and got burned out of his house. He almost died because he was trying to put stuff in a bag that that um, that he needed to have in advance, but he hadn't planned. And so he had smoke inhalation. He had burns on his body from trying to save his his documents and his you know and and it was just. It was a tragedy, and and how many how many times that could have been taken care of 
just by following these this the checklist. Uh, and you do work. Can we get the checklist from you? Can people go to the Red Cross website and find a copy of this this uh, slide here? Um, yeah, or um, actually, if they want to, I, I, I pulled this out of Earthquake Country Alliance. It wasn't actually, it has the information on it here, info at Earthquake um, at the very bottom, where you can go and get it. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, you know, you had a good point in, uh, you know, preparing and whatever. So it's kind of interesting. When my kids visit me, they live in Los Angeles, right? And so they come with me, and I've got all this stuff in a go bag. And they say, Dad, Dad, why do you have all this stuff and it's taking up room? And I said, well, you never know if you're going to get stuck for an hour, two hours, three hours. You need to have all this stuff available, right? So they will he and haul and whatever. And then, but I say, no, that you are going to have this go bag when you go across that grapevine <laughs> to get out to Los Angeles. So you are ready. And, you know, some people will resist and whatever. I'll get it later. I'll do, well, sometimes later is too late. Yeah. Yeah. And if and if the power goes down, you can't get your prescriptions. And if the power goes down, you can't get money and you can't buy gas. And and all you have is, or if you have twenty dollar bills and you buy two dollars worth of gas, you're still paying twenty dollars bills. You get you've got to think about how you spend your money or how you need your prescriptions. You think about those things in advance. You put and you're saying you put it in that go bag or the pillow. Mm -hmm. And then when you need it and you, and leave it alone right. so that when, if there isn't a disaster, if there is an emergency, you just grab it and go knowing that you have a pair of glasses in there or you have what you need in there. Right. 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 Exactly. Good point. Mm -hmm. And you see, this is pretty easy. I mean, actually a lot of people don't even have a, a go bag at work. I mean, we've been in some cases back on the East Coast where basically you were stuck at work for two or three days because of the snow or whatever. Well, anymore, I'm not stuck anymore because I got my go bag for work. So this is just a listing of things. You can have it readily available and um, hopefully it'll make people feel more comfortable uh, when they go someplace or. Okay. Tom, I have a question. What is the Red Cross's website? Uh, information redcross.org www.redcross.org uh -huh. that's a simple thing there um right. another thing i i was out at the lilac festival this weekend talking with a lot of people about being prepared and people always you know there's a lot of people who think they are prepared and then there's a lot of people who really are prepared and they share things like um for instance uh, that we have we hand out a card uh, uh, of current fire safe council where you could put write in all your phone numbers because if your phone goes down the tower goes down and you get someplace and somebody hands you a phone and your phone's not working and the numbers are on the phone you don't know how to call anybody so you have this card to use in your wallet or in your pocket or whatever but they also said, you should keep one in your car for God forbid you're in an accident and you can't tell the first responders anything and they can find that card somewhere and it'll have your name and emergency numbers on it, which would save them a whole lot of time to get you help. And, and so, you know, like it's a lot of simple things like that, that uh, people share. And I think that's great. You know, you brought up a good point, and that's why I brought up this one here. It says, get connected. I don't know if you can see it on the screen or not. But again, you have a radio, so you can talk to those radio stations. Ready Kern, um, or in other words, they will tell you about where is the hazard, what roads are open, things. But this smart 911, this is unique. This is really good because a lot of people said, okay, important telephone numbers or uh, medication or whatever. You have all that in when you do when you register for Smart 911, and that information will then when they when you call 911, that operator and EMT will be able to get that information. They'll know this is the person I have to call. You know, that, with that Smart 911, what I was told is that there's someone in your family that may have a problem with mental illness. 
right. or, you know, like, uh, or, and a whole bunch of people show up. You can put that in the smart 911 that you have people in your home that may not react well to a lot of people showing up and be prepared for that. Right, exactly. Yeah. So at least that EMT or whatever knows has some background information on you when you come. I, I, I put everything in there for my, from the doctors to um, uh, all types of uh, surgeries I've had in the past, all my medications, everything. <laughs> So I'm going to give the EMT an advantage over, you know, because a lot of people can't even communicate, right? There's no way. That's right. That's right. Now, there's another question. Yeah. If there is a major earthquake in Kern County and roads to the Fraser Mountain communities or other rural areas are damaged and impassable, does the Red Cross use helicopters to get here or what does happen? No, no, no. Um, I think you know, the Red Cross doesn't have emergency vehicles like this. We will open up shelters or whatever. It's the county that will then uh, and the police and the fire that will mobilize and whatever, whatever is needed to help move the people. The Red Cross doesn't provide anything like that. Right. So so the message you've had it on a slide and it's in the ready, set, go. Uh, be prepared. Uh, you might end up being uh, uh, have to shelter in place until uh, the county can get here if there's an earthquake and the roads are closed. Right. Uh, so it's basically if you live, if you're living up here, you need to be prepared. Would well, you? You brought, up, you brought up a good point because weren't, didn't you? Um, you guys were stranded up there because of all the snow. For right. seven days. Road, roads couldn't. They couldn't get to you. What three days? Four days? Yeah, well, it depended on where you lived, you know, right. people had it for a very long time. Right. And that's what we have found in most of the other places is most of the time, if it's really bad, the um, responders will not be able to get you for three or four days. So that's why we're recommending that people have at least enough water and food for pets and everybody for three to four days. Well, that goes back to the idea that uh, an earthquake affects a whole lot of people. And if you're in a small community and a large community is in big trouble too, at the same time, um, you might not be served right away. You might be one of the last seen because you are remote. You are not, uh, not in the front of the line, so to speak. That uh, you have to, you know, you're halfway up the hill, the earthquake strikes and you're stuck and you have to wait until they get to you. So you gotta be prepared. You gotta have your stuff with you, you know, because it's just you, you know, that's your responsibility. Right, exactly. And it's, it's your responsibility in addition to the people that are either staying with you or your families. That's what I look at. Hey, it's yeah. my responsibility to keep my family safe. So I will make sure I have everything available. Um, unfortunately, there's too much, um, Oh, well, the fire department will get to me. I don't have to worry about it, or I don't have to do any backup for anything. Well, uh, that's not really true. <laughs> right. I was talking with one of the Forest Service uh, uh, rangers who was uh, on the fire lines up in the Kern, uh, Kern River Valley the last couple of years. And the fire was basically like in his backyard one day, but he was stationed somewhere else with his crew. And he went to his... Um, captain and said, look, we're getting messages from home and we have to go there. If things are getting worse at home, we're leaving here where we're supposed to be and going back to our home. So you have to remember that the first responders are also humans with families and, and they need to respond to that as well, as wonderful as they are for showing up to help us. Good point. Yeah, that's right. Um... I wish people would could picture them being a fireman or going in here to you know do save people like that. Yeah, they're a human too. That's right. Any other questions? You know, I really liked what you said a few minutes ago about um, you know in my one of my past lives, I had a bed and breakfast. I could sleep fifteen people, so we had to have food for fifteen people for up for like a week in advance, just in case that there was a problem. Because when they're living, if you have guests, if you have people in your house, if you have neighbors that aren't prepared, 
you know, you're going to reach out to them. You're going to, you're going to have to, uh, uh, it becomes a communal effect and a, a community uh, outreach to each other. And uh, if you're prepared, encourage your neighbors to be prepared. Uh, I, I think all of those things are so important right now, uh, certainly with the, the tenor of the times when, uh, you know, suddenly we, you know, they cancel all the flights or something like that. So the, you've got, um, you have to take responsibility for your own safety in many ways, and then to know who to call if you can get out. Yeah, good point. I, I want to bring up one other thing that I think is really important is some people says, okay, my house is safe. I've done everything I can, have enough food, make sure all the windows are open and whatever. But I always tell people, I says, when you go to somebody else's house, you do the same thing. You go there and see that you can get the windows open. You go there to make sure that you can get the doors open or something, you know, you can get out. Um, I know in Bakersfield, we run into a lot of problems like on Union Avenue or whatever, where on the restaurants. And the first thing that I do when I go in is I go back into the back bathroom and I make sure that can I get the doors open to get out of that, the back door. And most of the times you'll find out they're, they're chain closed or the doors, they have bars on the windows. And in that case, I have a choice. I decide whether I'm going to stay there or what I typically do is I always get a table right by the front door. <laughs> but again, when you go to somebody else's house, you do due diligence and you look to make sure that you have a way out. And if, if, if you don't see it, I had to tell my, my friend uh, back on the East Coast, I said, hey, this is a choice I'm gonna make. I either stay at your house or I'm gonna go to bed with a sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I went to bed with a sledgehammer, right? I said, I feel safer now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any more questions in the chat room. David, do you have any? Um, no. Um... You know, I, I feel good about it. Um, well, well, there's one thing. When uh, when someone comes to you in a disaster, they've lost everything. Will the Red Cross be able to help them start putting their lives back together, like financially help them? You know, are there are there people that that come in and volunteer for the Red Cross to help those kind of things, the aftermath of a disaster? Yeah, well, that's the biggest problem that we have because how to prepare for a disaster. Then what happens is we put the people in the shelters, right? We take their information, right? So they're in the shelter. They may be in the shelter for a week, a month, or whatever. But we always assign a caseworker to those that family or person. And that caseworker will work with them and says, okay, you've lost everything. These are the agencies that you can go to to get help. These are agencies you can go to get uh, loans or whatever. This is where you can get medication. So we work with them and that caseworker may be assigned to that person to help them out maybe anywhere from two months to seven months. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a huge program. So you don't see all this stuff behind the scenes, but they're called caseworkers. We have a lot of them and there's a big need for those two. Right. Okay. Wow. Boy, there was a, my ears talked off. Uh, Tom, thank you for your, for your help on that and clarifying a lot of stuff because we all see the Red Cross, but we don't necessarily know what it does. Um, I wanna thank everybody for being here today. Uh, the, like I said, the, the, the website currentfiresafe.org uh, has, if you have more questions, you can ask them there and um, get, a, get an answer back. If you have a topic for a webinar, you can a a write it there. If you know something you can advise people on, um, you have that there. There are many resources on the website to help you, and your feedback is always welcome. And you can re, uh, you can look at the previous webinars also. Um, let's see. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Our next webinar is going to be June 27th at 5 p.m. on Zoom, which with uh, Richie Sayabong from the Community Relations and Outreach Branch of the California Department of Insurance. Yeah, <laughs> gotta have the insurance. Watch for that flyer. Um, thank you once again uh, for coming. Uh, I'm David Stenstrom. Thank you, Kathleen, for helping. And we wish you all a good night and remind you uh, that lot clearance must be completed by June 1st. 
<laughs> anyway, thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. I'm David Stenstrom. Good night. Thank you. Bye, David. Thank you, Tom. Okay, bye.